So uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, I'm an associate professor at the at Emory University in the Division of Endocrinology, and I work mainly at Grady. Um, so I'll be talking to you about the practical use of oral anti-diabetic agents. Um, these, these are my conflicts of interest. Um, I do have uh, the only medications that I'll talk about that are made by these companies are potentially linagliptin, but I'll mention it by class. Um, and Beringer Ingelheim makes that and empagliflozin. I'll talk about it in one of my studies. Um, it's an SGLT2 inhibitor as well. So, and so uh, throughout the whole thing, I'll, um, I like case-based learning um, because I could throw out different mechanisms, safety, but really the main thing is how do you use it? How do you use these oral anti-diabetic agents? So I typically like to go through a case and, um, and um, just make little variations on the case. So, um, you know, kind of picking what, and then I'll go through the guidelines and how I pick what medications based on the guidelines and the case. So um, Mr. Smith um, is a 60-year-old patient with newly diagnosed diabetes on routine testing with his PCP. He has a history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity, common comorbidities that we see with type 2 diabetes. Um, he doesn't have any heart disease or renal disease. Um, he has a family history of type 2, again, very typical of new onset diabetes, correct? And medications, he's on amlodipine, atorvastatin. His BMI is high. He's 34, um, puts him in the obese category. Um, he's, he's like, you know, I'm going to start working on diet. He starts exercise. His A1C is 8%. His fasting glucose is 180 milligrams per deciliter. Hold on one second. And so what's your first agent of choice? Um, we're going to try this new thing called polling. So... Um, Ina, if you can put the poll up. Um, again, there's no wrong answer, so I'd just like to know what your choices are. And I'll give you guys a minute. Ina, is the poll done? Uh, we can end it as you told me. Okay. Um, Should I end it now? Um, sure. Let's end it. Are you able to see it? I cannot. <laughs> and pulling. And then share the results. Yep. Okay. Everybody said metformin. Uh, good choice. Some said glipizide. Um, no one said citagliptin um, or a DPP-4 inhibitor, thiazolinodione or uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. Okay. So most of you, um, say, it seems like there's a consensus. So let's talk about some of the data. Okay. So when we look at what anti-diabetic agents to use, we have um, lots of choices. Uh, you know, when I was a fellow, there were maybe like five or six choices, but since then, now we have 12 classes of medication that target different sites um, of, that are involved in the pathophysiology of diabetes. So which one do you pick? How do you pick? And so there's the ACE guidelines, and again, another disclosure, I'm on the guidelines um, committee, so, but I'll go through the ADA guidelines, which I think most of us do use. Um, so the ACE guidelines, uh, this is the American College, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, they actually, and this is just to illustrate a different way of looking at things. So what they really do is they say, you know, individualize the goals based on their A1C, A1C less than 6.5 or A1C greater than 6.5. You can have different medications. And with their, you know, algorithm, they start with an A1C less than 7.5. Um, they suggest actually you can start any of these as monotherapy, of course, um, independent if they don't, unless they have cardiac disease or kidney disease, which I'll go over soon. <clears throat> and if they have an A1C greater than 7.5 to 9, they actually suggest double or triple therapy, which is fine to use as well. Um, and if their A1C is really high, like greater than 10, great, um, and or, and or, they have catabolic syndrome 
or if they have catabolic symptoms, um, you can start with insulin right away. So it depends on the patient, how he's, so going back to Mr. Smith, you know, he's in your office, hasn't had much weight loss per se, although um, no history of kidney disease, no history of um, high blood pressure. So, you know, any of these choices are fine. Sorry, my screen is not advancing. Um, and then these are the ADA guidelines, which have gotten more complicated over the years. But if you look at, so if you don't pay attention to all of this, the first thing they say is actually first line, um, including weight management and physical activity. So metformin is the first line, uh, which all of you are correct. Uh, metformin, I would do first line. <clears throat> it's cheap, it's um, efficacious. Um, and it doesn't, um, and most people tolerate it. And, you know, dosing, how do you start it? 500 milligrams at night, I typically say with dinner, then increase to twice a day. The maximum dose is 2,550 milligrams per day. Um, however, beyond 2,000 milligrams per day, there's not much efficacy. And in this person, you know, the A1C can reduce by one to 2%. So in our patient who has an A1C of 8%, if your goal is 7% or below that, you can get that with metformin. So monotherapy would be fine in this patient. Um, <clears throat> you know, if his A1C is 9, 10, sure, monotherapy may not be enough. You may have to start two agents to get him to goal to less than 7%. Um, sometimes patients will say, well, you know, doc, give me a trial of, don't start so many medications on, uh, on me. Um, give me a trial of diet and exercise. <clears throat> and if they do that, then I'm fine starting monotherapy with metformin. Um, the advantages are no hypoglycemia if you use it by itself. Um, it can lower triglyceride levels and LDL levels, and it may decrease cardiac risks as well. And it's very affordable in Georgia, Publix, uh, one of the grocery stores has uh, metformin for free. Uh, but $4 in most other pharmacies. Uh, disadvantages are GI side effects. So typically uh, most patients experience less of this if you start it, start at a low dose and go up slowly. Very rare risk of lactic acidosis. And then occasionally you can get B12 malabsorption. So you started him on metformin, um, started at 500 milligrams, went up to BID, titrated up to 1000 milligrams BID, his A1C was great, we reached our goal. Comes back at 12 months, his A1C goes up a little bit, you know, 7.2, and he says, well, you know, I'm gonna increase exercise, fine. You see him back at 24 months and his A1C is eight. So he's failed um, or he's had hyperglycemia on top of metformin monotherapy. So what do you think? You guys think this is okay or, right? So is this expected? And the question, and the, and the answer is yes, it is expected. Um, you know, metformin monotherapy, this is uh, the status from the UK PDS, which is um, the UK diabetes control study, um, <clears throat> which looked at people with type two diabetes and looked at does A1C less than seven, does that decrease complications? That was the main study. And um, so most patients, what they found, and it's, you know, they had a long follow-up as well. And what they found was that three years um, in patients who are adequately controlled and treated with metformin, within three years, um, the people who have A1C less than seven decreases. So by year six, only 34% will be fine on monotherapy. Uh, by nine years, um, sorry, uh, only 13% will be on monotherapy. And so, again, if they were controlled on sulfonylureas, which is the, um, another anti-diabetic agent, as you guys know, like glipizide, gliburide, um, follows a similar course. So most people will fail monotherapy. They'll need more than one therapy. And so, and the reason for this is that, you know, by the time you get diagnosed with diabetes, so the y-axis is beta cell function, the x-axis is time. So by the time you get diagnosed with diabetes, you've lost about 50% of your beta cell function. Mm -hmm. And with time, um, your beta cell function just declines over time. And so, and you know, in a patient like him, 
yes, there's a lot of patients that, you know, it's Christmas. They just got off their diet or exercise. Something stressful in their life happens. Sure, there are lifestyle measures, but, you know, if they've been doing everything um, that they're supposed to do for diabetes care, and they still need, um, their A1C still out of control, you know, it's important for us to reassure them that, um, unfortunately, this is the normal course of diabetes. Um, you need more, you may need more and more medications over time. Um, <clears throat> and so I think it's really important for our patients to kind of put this out there um, and can, um, just so they don't feel guilty or they don't, they're very, or, we have to make sure that they're not resistant to treating their diabetes with more medications if needed. So, and so what would be your next agent of choice? He failed metformin, um, he's been doing exercise, he's been trying to do um, work on his diet, his A1C is seven, um, oh, sorry, his A1C is back up again. Um, metformin controlled him for a little bit, but he failed monotherapy. What would be your next agent of choice? Let me launch the yeah. second poll. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna launch polling. You guys able to see it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. Let's give you guys about 30 seconds or so. No one has seen. Mm -hmm. Sixty percent of the people already voted. We're gonna wait for a few seconds. Okay. Again, um, this patient was on metformin, failed monotherapy. What would be your next? Again, there is no wrong answers. Okay. We can go. We'll go through the case and see why we would pick one over the other. So in the polling right now, and I'm okay. Share the results. Okay, so this one's a little bit more evenly distributed with 36% uh, saying sulfonylurea, glipizide. Uh, no one picked pioglitazone, um, and a few picked liraglutide, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist, and uh, some of you picked, um, well, it's 29% picked SGLT2 inhibitor, and 18% uh, picked a DPP-4 inhibitor. All right, so let's go through, you know, how you would go about picking the next agent. So in the past, um, so let's go back to the case, right? So same case, same guy, 60, initial presentation, sorry. 60-year-old um, man, uh, newly diagnosed diabetes, routine testing. Um, the key thing is he's got no heart disease or renal disease, uh, but the thing to focus on is his BMI. You know, that's 34. And no heart disease or renal disease. So when you go back to the ADA algorithm, you look at, well, where does he fit in in here? So maybe here, you know, um, weight loss would definitely help with insulin resistance, um, and that could reduce his um, A1C. Um, and again, he has no history of heart disease, so you don't necessarily need to go down this pathway of which one to pick. Um, and I'll go through these cardiovascular trials in a few more slides. Um, and right now, you know, there's no compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia. He's just on metformin. Um, so, and we'll talk about cost as well. So, so right now, maybe weight loss would be something to um, address. So if weight loss is, a, is the main thing, um, the guidelines recommend actually starting with either an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with efficacy for weight loss. Um, so most GLP-1 receptor agonists have some weight loss. Um, liraglutide uh, with, the, with the formulation of Saxenda, which is three milligrams, which is a higher dose than we use for diabetes, has weight loss data, but most GLP-1 receptor agonists do have some weight loss. Um, so what is a GLP-1 receptor agonist? So let me just step back a little and go through the mechanism. Uh, they're based on the incretin system. 
uh, the incretin effect. So the incretin effect is, um, so the difference between the insulin release between oral versus um, IV insulin infusion. So um, in this, these are two graphs um, with the y-axis being plasma glucose and the x-axis being time. So patients or people were given in the red oral glucose and they were also given, the same people were given IV glucose at a separate time where they matched the glucose levels. Okay, so the glucose levels were matched with the same amount of oral glucose. And so they measured uh, C-peptide, which is a measure of insulin secretion based on either oral or IV glucose. So if you look at the graph, the red line depicting the insulin response to oral glucose, it's much higher than the insulin response to IV glucose. So this difference, you know, the only thing that's different is you had glucose through the gut versus IV. So, um, <clears throat> so this difference in insulin secretion is called the in incretin effect. And the incretin effect we know now are mediated by different hormones called GLP-1 and GIP-1 and GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is one of our um, medication pharmacologic agent that we'll talk about. So how does the incretin um, system work? Um, so you eat something um, like food, any type of food with the glucose load, you get your gut actually releases GLP-1 and GIP and they act on the beta cells uh, to stimulate postprandial insulin secretion. They also decrease glucagon secretion, so you decrease hepatic glucose production, so your fasting glucose can be lower. Um, it can potentially um, increase peripheral glucose uptake. And then we think there's, um, or there are GLP-1 receptors in the brain, uh, which can induce satiety, and it also slows down gastric emptying. So our medications that we base them on are GLP-1 receptor agonist, okay? So, so they, they stimulate the GLP-1 receptor and or GIP, the drugs, they're still kind of in the pipeline. Um, there's been studies done to look at that as well. And then there's an enzyme called DPP-4, which degrades your endogenous, the GLP-1 receptor that you secrete, that a person secretes. So DPP-4 inhibitors inhibit the DPP-4. So it, um, <clears throat> um, it increases your endogenous, the half-life of your endogenous GLP-1 receptor agonist. And the GLP-1 receptor agonists are actually immune to these DPP-4, to the proteolytic degradation of um, DPP-4s. And so what's the relative glycemic therapy? So when used as monotherapy, actually they can reduce the A1C not by that much compared to placebo. But when you look at it as compared to like say glimepiride, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, um, exenatide, they actually all have some glycemic efficacy. So exenatide once a week, um, dulaglutide, albiglutide, there was a little bit of an increase <laughs> um, when compared to placebo but most of them you do see a decrease. And so, okay, so you prescribed him liraglutide um, to be titrated. We usually titrate at a lower dose. Most GLP ones, this is what we do. Um, and then we titrate to 1.8 milligrams daily. But he says, you know what? It costs a lot, $100 per month. And that's just the copay and he can't afford it. So what would you consider? So then the algorithm kind of goes into cost. You know, what if cost was an issue, which is it is in this patient. So the choices that the guidelines recommend is a sulfonylurea or TZD at Grady. We do have the Grady um, subsidized um, <clears throat> subs uh, subsidy, which does allow us to prescribe any class of anti-diabetic medications. We may not have all, all different types, but we have the different classes. Uh, but, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, formulary changes every year, um, and cost is a real big issue. So let's talk about sulfonylureas and TZDs. They're old, uh, but sulfonylureas have been around since the 50s. And, you know, they increase insulin secretions for, um, <clears throat> from beta cells, from pancreatic beta cells, by binding to the sulfonylurea receptor. 
you can use them as monotherapy, but you can combine them with other medications, other classes as well. So including metformin, um, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, DPP-4s, SGLT2s, and even, you know, sometimes insulin or GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, although I don't prefer to do it with insulin. One second. That. Um, And the sulfonylureas, there's different types. There's gliburide. You can start at 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams daily. Um, you can go up to max 20 milligrams a day, but I prefer not to go up that high. Um, glipizide, 2.5 milligrams. You can start with 2.5 milligrams, but if it's more than 15 milligrams, then we split the dose, but I don't typically give more than 10 milligrams a day. Um, with glimepiride, you can start with the one to two milligrams a day and max of eight milligrams a day. And you can get an A1C reduction of one to 2%. And it's typically well tolerated, it's affordable, uh, but the main disadvantage is that you do gain weight. Uh, you can get hypoglycemia if you miss meals. Um, <clears throat> and, but in fact, you know, our guidelines say cost. And in fact, the World Health Organization came out with guidelines for diabetes treatment two years ago. And they actually suggest sulfonylurea as their second line because most of the world, um, especially in the developing world, um, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, all these newer medications are very expensive. <clears throat> and let's talk about TZDs. Um, TZDs, thiazolid thiazolidiones, um, they increase insulin sensitivity in muscle and fat. And at higher doses, they can decrease hepatic gluconeogenesis. Um, they may be used as monotherapy, but you can combine them with other medications, including metformin. Um, so TZDs do have a bad reputa reputation. Uh, they do cause weight gain. Um, there is, um, <clears throat> um, you can have higher um, cardiac heart failure, uh, congestive heart failure risk. They are a little bit more expensive than sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea are about $4 um, a prescription. And, and they also need a long onset of actions. You need about 30 days to see the full effect. Um, and you can actually even take three to six months. And some contraindications are hepatic dysfunction, um, active liver disease, heart failure. Um, and some warnings are caution and CKD, potential liver toxicity. You need to check LFTs. And, you know, in 2007, um, rosiglitazone was actually pulled off the market because of this meta-analysis where um, <clears throat> showed that, you know, um, they looked at all the studies with pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, and they showed that rosiglitazone actually can increase myocardial infarction and death. Um, and again, this is a meta-analysis. Um, and people were like, well, you know, people with type 2 diabetes are at high risk for cardiac disease. That's what most people die of, um, at least people with type 2 diabetes. And so why give them a medication? Sure, it has glycemic effects, but why give them a medication that would cause cardio, increased cardiovascular risk? And so it came off the market. Um, Rosiglitazone definitely came off the market. Pioglitazone also came off the market in many countries. Um, however, in 2013, the FDA looked at the data again and showed that there's actually no elevated cardiovascular risk, but most of us don't really give prescribed rosiglitazone. Uh, most of us do give um, pioglitazone if there's no other choices, <clears throat> especially with weight gain. Um, <clears throat> And I also don't give TZDs in postmenopausal women uh, just because there's an increase in bone turnover. Uh, this was a study done, at, done by our group, um, <clears throat> sorry, published in 2013, which looked at patients. They took bone biopsies of patients and showed that there's actually more, um, <clears throat> more osteoclastic um, or bone degeneration um, that in patients who took DZDs. So in our patient, you know, I think it's, um, if cost is an issue um, and, you know, with 
sacrificing weight gain, we can give TZDs or sulfonylureas. Uh, we need to tell patients that <clears throat> we need to tell patients that you know they can gain weight, hypoglycemia risk, uh, but you know we weigh that with the benefit of cost. Uh, we do have long; it is efficacious. They are efficacious. They will get the A1C down, uh, barring if they don't have any other side effects. So. Um, Okay, so let's move on a little bit. So what if it's the same patient? He came in with newly diagnosed diabetes on admission into the hospital for a myocardial infarction, and he's got a history of hypertension, dyslip dyslipidemia, and obesity, so same medical history. And now he's got, you, re you look in his chart, and you see that he's got some stenosis in his cardiac arteries. His CKD is stage two. Um, his estimated GFR is 50, same family history, same other medications, his BMI is still obese, his A1C is 8%. On discharge, his fasting glucose was 180 milligram de per deciliter. What would be his discharge medication? So would metformin still be your first choice given that he's got some kidney disease, he's got some heart disease, um, <clears throat> And he still has other factors being the same. So I can launch the poll. I'm gonna launch the poll. Okay. Here we go. Anyway, a few seconds more. Fifty-eight mm -hmm. percent of the people um, voted, so I'm gonna end sixty-sixty percent. So I'm gonna end the poll, okay, and then share the results. Here we go. 50-50, this is hmm, interesting, this is neat. Um, so let's talk about the data. Can you give metformin still, given that he's got CKD and, um, <clears throat> and new, heart, new heart or heart disease? So metformin, um, so, you know, metformin, um, and I'll talk about the newer cardiovascular outcome studies. Nobody's going to do that study with metformin because it's cheap. There's no drug company that's going to sponsor this huge study. But, um, you know, looking at observational data from the UK PDS um, <clears throat> and this where they randomized patients to intensive control, which was A1C less than seven, seven or less, and conventional, which is this uh, blue line, and intensive is the, is the orange line. And so A1C initially went down, but it climbed back up, but still lower than um, patients with the conventional therapy. And they looked at risk reductions with the intensive therapy, what got reduced compared to conventional therapy. So any diabetes related endpoint, um, you know, was reduced. My microvascular endpoints, again, 25%, as we know. Um, and the need for laser surgery decreased. And, but really what I want you to follow, uh, what I want you to um, see is this myocardial infarction. People whose A1C was reduced um, to seven or less, they actually had a 16% six per, um, decrease in, their, in the incidence of myocardial infarction. Um, now they didn't stratify whether it was people who had prior myocardial infarction, prior heart disease, and they prevented the next attack, but really it just, and you know, it's not statistically significant, but our statistician always says, what's the difference between P of 0.05 versus 0.046? Um, but there's a trend towards reduction is what is the main point. So you can actually see uh, dramatic decreases um, in myocardial infarction with metformin and Again, lowering A1C reduction overall reduces myocardial in 1% A1C lowering 
does reduce the risk of myocardial infarction by 14%. Definitely more with microvascular, but not, you know, it's not insignificant. 14% um, is not an insignificant redu reduction. So, and then uh, when you look again in overweight patients, when you look over time, the incidence of myocardial infarction with metformin is, is the same UKPDS. This is 15 years out after randomization shows actually a decrease with metformin, um, a decrease overall in intensive therapy, but also just metformin um, versus conventional therapy, there's a decrease in the incidence of myocardial infarction. And the similar overall values, um, annual rates during 10, I think this is all supposed to be read, but um, you do see much lower um, number of events with metformin. So metformin does work, and this is important to know because a lot of our patients can't afford that copay of a GLP-1 first line or SGLT-2 first line. So metformin does uh, work. So, and you know, what about CKD? So in the, on the, um, on the package of metformin, there is a war, um, it says contraindicated in patients with the creatinine greater than 1.3 in men, greater than 1.2 in women. But creatinine doesn't tell the whole story. Um, creatinine just gives you, you know, creatinine depends on how muscular you are. Someone who's frail or, you know, someone my size, creatinine could be 1.5 could be high, but someone who's a bodybuilder, a creatinine of 1.5 could have a normal GFR. So, um, so relatively recently, um, you know, there's again no randomized control study to show this, but um, there's a consensus or like expert agreement that depending on the CKD stage, depending on the uh, GFR, uh, the maximal doses of with the recommended maximal doses of metformin. So they actually suggest that if you can actually give metformin up to a GFR of 30. So if someone's already on metformin and their GFR becomes 32, um, of course, you're not going to initiate therapy, but you can actually continue the drug, but reduce the dose. If someone's between 45 to 60, um, if you think their kidney function is going to get worse, so in the hospital, for example, fluid changes, or if you're doing, um, or if you expect that they're on some sort of an antibiotic that will cause, that may cause ATN, and they and you expect their GFR to go down even maybe temporarily, um, then you would avoid it. But if you think that's their GFR, that's their, you know, it's their chronic kidney disease, their GFR is going to stay the same. Um, would actually continue metformin, or even you can actually initiate metformin. So, and then um, as far as sulfonylureas, um, you know, people say in the past people have said, well, sulfonylurea. So, um, just as an answer to that question, I would do metformin in patients who have new cardiac disease and um, and CKD up to um, initiating therapy, I would, you know, if they're 45 or above, I would initiate therapy. Um, if they're 45 or below, I wouldn't initiate therapy, but if they're on metformin, I would continue. So, and then um, there's definitely some data out there about sulfonylureas, not um, that they decrease reperfusion of ischemic, of the ischemic heart. So, um, and, you know, studies have looked at to see, well, are sulfonylurea safe um, in people with cardiac disease? So there was a publication called the Carolina study, which got published last year. Um, it was a multinational randomized clinical study that looked at linagliptin, which is a DPP-4, um, versus glimepiride, which is a sulfonylurea in patients who had already established cardiovascular disease. Um, that was about six years of median duration. And they looked at cardiovascular safety of linagliptin compared to sulfonylurea, and um, <clears throat> they were both added to whatever the patients were on before, um, like say they were on metformin. And there's actually no difference in cardio cardiovascular outcome. So sulfonylureas are also safe to give for whatever reason you don't want to give metformin. 
<clears throat> but, you know, what if, yeah, um, but, you know, let's go back to the other considerations. You can give metformin, um, say the patient's already on metformin, and you do need glycemic, um, you do need more glycemic efficacy, you know, metformin didn't work, or it, um, or they couldn't tolerate metformin for whatever reason, which one would you pick? So if cardiac disease predominates mostly, um, our guidelines say to go with the GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, <clears throat> and if A1C is above target, then you can pick the other medications, um, other classes of medications, um, such as insulin, DPP-4, STZDs, or sulfonylurea. Um, so this is the main differentiation of this guidelines. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about some of these cardiovascular outcome studies. These recommendations come from a long list of cardiovascular studies that were done recently. Um, so the FDA since 2008 has recommended, again, people with type 2 diabetes have high cardiovascular risk. So <clears throat> we don't want to give a medication that Yes, it could be efficacious, but you don't want to give a medication that can cause higher cardiac events or mortality from cardiac disease. So they require all new medications and even some medications that were approved to have um, <clears throat> cardiovascular outcome trials. And all of them um, have to report on something called MACE, which is a composite of cardiovascular mortality, MI, and stroke. And MACE can also include, it can be a three-point MACE, or, um, <clears throat> or it can be um, acute coronary syndrome, urgent revascularization, or some other endpoints like heart failure, stroke, um, sorry, uh, hospitalization for stroke. Um, and they just need to have an enough endpoints. And they typically, and this is important to know, but they typically pick all the people that they were included had prior cardiac disease. So this, these trials are not for primary prevention. So they're for secondary prevention. <clears throat> and the reason to pick a high risk population is that yes, cardiac disease is high in patients with type two diabetes, but overall the absolute risk isn't as high. So you'd need to follow a patient for about 20 years or so to get you know, data on primary prevention. So to really show efficacy within a few years, um, most of the studies or all the studies pick patients who are already at high risk of cardiac disease or had a prior cardiac event. <clears throat> so when you look at DPP-4 inhibitors, so these are saxagliptin, um, linagliptin, um, citagliptin, they actually showed um, no difference in cardiovascular outcomes. They're actually very neutral. <laughs> so they won't cause harm, they won't cause, um, but they won't give any benefit either. Except um, saxagliptin and allogliptin. Um, saxagliptin, they did find that there was a higher risk of hospitalization for heart failure. Um, so if a patient has cardiac disease and also heart failure, I would not recommend saxagliptin um, or allogliptin. And so these are new warning, or these were warnings that were added to saxagliptin and allogliptin. But if you just want glycemic efficacy, you can add saxagliptin if that's what their insurance covers or allogliptin. <clears throat> and as far as GLP-1 receptor agonists, so again, all of them have uh, cardiovascular outcome trials. Um, they're short acting and long acting. So the short acting are typically daily or twice, well, they're more, um, not daily, sorry, they're twice a day. So they're exenatide or lixazenatide and long acting, which are exenatide weekly. And all of these are weekly medications, the ones listed. <clears throat> and what was really interesting is with these longer acting medications, some of them, um, <clears throat> liraglutide, semaglutide, albiglutide, when they looked at the cardiovascular outcomes, and this was not expected, um, and this is independent of glycemic control. So their placebo group versus the drug, um, the, the intervention, they actually had similar A1Cs. So the effect was not by A1C. So there was something independent going on where 
if you look at liraglutide, you start to see the separation of these curves um, <clears throat> around six to 12 months. Um, similarly in semaglutide, around 12 months, and as well as in albiglutide. Uh, the people who were placed on a GLP-1 receptor agonist actually had a lower incidence of heart um, cardiovascular events, so MACE. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so they do show some cardiovascular benefit as well, except for um, exenatide weekly and lixacenatide. Um, there was actually no difference in CV outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes, and nobody really knows why. Um, you know, maybe the patients that they picked were not at high risk, um, as, as higher risk as the other population. Um, <clears throat> um, so there's different um, thoughts on this, but, and then the one thing is in semaglutide, people had worsening retinopathy, uh, whether they had prior retinopathy, or you know their A1C reduction was really fast, and when we see that, there is actually a higher incidence of retinopathy. So maybe that was it. Um, so those are the potential reasons why we see these adverse outcomes, or not the outcomes that we expect. <clears throat> and so in effect, um, so overall, so if you're looking for cardiovascular safety and actually benefit. So all these drugs with a heavy neutral effect, they're safe to give. You can give, but if you wanted additional benefit of cardiovascular risk reduction, um, so far these are the medications that you can um, add on to metformin. And so uh, moving on, we go back to the case again. Um, you know, Mr. Smith, again, same age, came to the hospital for MI and has now you know, he got an echocardiogram uh, with this, you know, he got a stent and everything, and then his EF is 35%. CKD is, stage is the same, EGFR is 50, and he has a family history of type 2 diabetes, medications, um, everything else is the same. So his discharge medication, in addition to metformin, you know, when you look back in the algorithm, now you see that heart failure predominates. Yes, he's got CAD, but it's more heart failure. So in this population, um, especially if the GFR is between 30 to 60 and um, EF is less than 45%, uh, the guidelines recommend, this is the ADA 2020 guidelines, um, so they recommend, the guidelines recommend an SGLT2 inhibitor because there is evidence that it does reduce heart failure and CKD production, uh, progression. And then if your A1C is still above target after all of that, avoid TZDs in the setting of heart failure but you can choose any other agents. Um, again, our DPP-4s, which are neutral, except for saxagliptin. <clears throat> and if a patient's already on um, like an SGLT2 inhibitor, you can add a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, you, could, you can add insulin always, um, or sulfonylurea. And so how do SGLT2 inhibitors work? So, SGLT2 inhibitors actually work on the kidney and they're independent of insulin secretion, um, <coughs> unlike a lot of our other medications. And so glucose, when it enters the proximal tubule, 90% is reabsorbed by the SGLT, uh, by the channel, by the SGLT2 channel, and about in, in the proximal tubule. About 10% is reabsorbed in the descending uh, loop of Henle. And what where SGLT2 inhibitors work is that they stop this reabsorption right there in the proximal tubule. So essentially, you have glucosuria, you have weight loss uh, because you're sick, uh, urinating out glucose. Um, so you have glycemic efficacy, and you know potentially because you do have more, it it may have a diuretic effect as well. Um, <clears throat> so SGLT2 inhibitors, there's canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, and the newest one, ertagliflozin. Uh, they do reduce your, the A1C by 0.8 or 1%. So not a huge, but you know, it is 1%, which is actually in diabetes efficacy, that's actually pretty significant. Um, they have a low risk of hypo, hypoglycemia, and if you use it by itself with insulin, they can get, you can have more hypoglycemia. Blood pressure does go down a little bit, 
HDL goes up and you can actually get a weight loss of 3.4 kilograms. So um, another added benefit. <clears throat> And you know, if someone's on metformin and if they were on a sulfonylurea, for example, if you add it as a third oral agent, um, <clears throat> this is compared to cetagliptin. Um, actually, SGLT2, canagliflozin was superior. And if you add it to, um, when compared to placebo, um, <clears throat> if you add empagliflozin, you get a 0.8% reduction in A1C. Uh, Dapagliflozin, you get a 0.9 reduction. and uh, with, I think this is also dapagliflozin, I apologize. Um, but if you have metformin and cetagliptin, you still get a reduction in A1C. So you do have glycemic efficacy when you add it as a third agent, uh, monotherapy. And the cardiovascular outcome trials, you know, there's Empareg, which was the first one that came out with empagliflozin, canagliflozin, the CANVAS trial. They all have cool names, dapagliflozin, the DECLARE study. And they all showed that there was a reduction in cardiovascular, in MACE, um, compared to placebo. <coughs> and when the interesting thing about this is that you see the separation of the curves, unlike with GLP-1 receptor agonists, where it was at 12 months, um, you see that separation pretty quickly by, um, uh, by three months, and same with the weeks here, um, pretty quickly. Um, Dapagliflozin had a little bit longer um, time before we showed the difference, but so again, this started, people started saying, well, this is independent of glucose control, so it's got to be something else going on. And there's many theories on why that's the case. And people are still um, investigating that effect. <clears throat> and then when they specifically looked for patients with hospitalizations from heart failure in these studies, um, and this was heart failure was another outcome, um, independent uh, within MACE or secondary outcomes, the heart failure was actually really remarkable for empagliflozin. See that separation, how lower hospitalizations for heart failure um, started immediately. Same with um, canagliflozin as well as dapagliflozin. So we think this is a class effect. So this is where the evidence for the guidelines comes when if heart failure predominates. And the renal studies, again, surprising results. Most of them found that um, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, they actually slow the progression of kidney disease. <clears throat> even in patients who have a GFR between 30 to 45. Below 30, I wouldn't use it. Uh, not that it's toxic, it's just that it wouldn't work. Um, <clears throat> um, it, with the GFR of less than 30, SGLT2 inhibitors don't work. So, And some caveats you got to uh, remember are genital mycotic infections, UTIs, orthostatic hypotension, new glycemic DKA. With the canagliflozin, there was an increased risk of amputations. So not a lot of people are using this. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, what if there's a need to minimize hypoglycemia? So these are patients, say it was our same case, but he's frail, um, he lives alone, um, he's 80, and um, <clears throat> can't move around much. And if hypoglycemia, you know, you don't want that patient to be hypoglycemic. So, but if hypoglycemia is an issue after metformin, you could start a DPP-4, GLP-1 receptor agonist, SGLT2 inhibitor, or TZDs. Of course, if he has heart failure or heart disease, you don't want to start TZDs. But all these other three, depending on insurance, patients ease, you can actually give these. Um, if someone's frail, though, and if you're worried about orthostatic hypotension, would not give an SGLT2 inhibitor. They don't want to inject medications. Um, you don't want to give a GLP-1 receptor agonist, especially if they're not cognitively intact. Um, a DPP-4 is typically what I add um, in like a frail patient. And overall, though, um, you know, we have all these agents that we can use. We have guidelines, but all of this depends on what your goal A1C is. Um, the, the idea is that, you know, Yes, we have algorithms, but really diabetes care is an art. Um, it depends on 
you know, how long the patients had had the disease, how long they're expected to live. If they have a long life expectancy, yes, I do want to give a kind of medication. Um, I want to get their A1C as low as they can, uh, however I do it. But if they've got, you know, hypoglycemia, life expectancy is low, they have comorbidities like retinopathy or amputation, for example, or if they've had MI, then, you know, my A1C goal may be a little bit less stringent. Um, and of course, patient pre preference, of course, um, and, you know, what they can afford. So in addition to their disease factors, um, you know, what I add also depends on um, what the patient wants to do. Um, you know, you have all these classes of medications, but hopefully with the case, I've illustrated different aspects I think about um, and what the guidelines say for you to think about when you, uh, when you want to change oral antidiabetic therapy. I added a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, yes, it's injectable, but it's not insulin, which will be your next, next talk. So in summary, uh, metformin is first line. Unless GFR is less than 30, you're unable to tolerate uh, if patients have acute heart failure. Um, if you're considering weight loss in addition to glycemic efficacy, add a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT-2 inhibitor. If you're thinking about cost, um, consider sulfonylureas or TZDs as next line. If a patient has established CAD, add a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, if it's CAD with CHF, add an SGLT2 inhibitor as the next one. If it's CKD, consider adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. And of course, if hypoglycemia, you have all these other choices. Um, SGLT2s, TZDs, GLP, wouldn't add insulin, wouldn't add um, a sulfonylurea. Okay, and that's my presentation.